Chuck Mosley was born on December 26, 1959, in Hollywood, California. He was adopted at the age of one and was renamed to Charles Henry Mosley III. I'm unsure what his original birth name was. His adopted parents were of the same exact ethnic makeup as his birth parents, which was Jewish, Black, and Native American. In a 2013 interview with Greg Prado of Brave Words, he had talked about writing an autobiography which would start with the story of how his parents met, as that was where his story began too. It starts with when they met at some kind of socialist, communist get-together in the 50s because they were interracial, my mom was Jewish, and my dad was black and American Indian, so that was controversial in itself. And then how they came together, kind of like the Brady Bunch. My dad had a daughter, and my mom had two daughters, and all they were missing was a boy, so they went out and adopted one, and it was me. He had a clear memory of his childhood, and in this interview he stated that it mirrored Anthony Kiedis's a lot. Though they didn't do the same exact things, sometimes they would be in the same exact places. Chuck remembered his parents as law-abiding, hard-working, down-to-earth people, but they hung out with a lot of hippies and crazy people growing up. His first memory was of someone talking gibberish to him while he was lying in a baby carriage. Later, he watched his father be labeled a communist in the Herald Examiner, be targeted by the FBI, and be forced to drink at different water fountains as Chuck's mother. His father would talk about leftist politics, dine with Charlie Chaplin, and at some point with bodyguard to Paul Robeson. I couldn't find any articles archived that talked about his father being a communist. Chuck was raised in South Central Los Angeles and Venice, California. One source states that, as he came of age in the 70s, Chuck found himself surrounded in an image-defining drug culture, which led to experimentation and abuse. It's in the past, but I grew up doing everything. I was crazy, he said. His influences consisted of David Bowie, Higgy Pop, Roxy Music, Motown, Black Flag, and more. He stated that he grew up in a house full of music, mostly classical and jazz, but his mother loved Zeppelin, prog rock, and Genesis. In a 2013 interview, Chuck stated that he had tried to find his birth parents, but I assume that he never did. There was never any update on this. Mosley first met musician Billy Gould in 1977 at a show with the Zeros, Johnny Novotny, and Bags. Chuck went on to play keyboards in Gould's first band, The Animated, in 1979. On the Metal Archives, Mosley's keyboard performances are dated around 1981 to 82. From there, he played in Haircuts That Kill from 1983 to 84. In 1983, he was asked to play a few shows with the band Faith No More. Come 1985, he joined Faith No More officially. Mosley replaced Courtney Love as the vocalist, where the band preferred to have a male vocalist. Chuck's first recording with the band is in the 1984 demo Faith, No More, with him on vocals. I'm unsure which songs he sung on exactly, as there isn't any indication on the archives, and the demo doesn't seem to be posted on YouTube. In 1985, Faith No More released their first album, We Care A Lot, on Mortem Records, which came out on vinyl and cassette. Mosley wrote the lyrics in most of the songs, except for Why Do You Bother, which was written by Bo Billy Gould. Other tracks were written with Mosley and keyboardist Roddy Bottom, or Mosley and Gould credited. The band's sound with Mosley on vocals is notably different than what they had when, they, when reaching fame in their later years. With Mosley, Faith No More reflected the very punk influences of the band and had a sound similar to what the soundtrack Return of the Living Dead sounded like, at least for me. You can just feel the underground punk scene of the 70s as the foundation of the music. I'd imagine that fans of these early albums would enjoy other bands like the Plasmatics. 
In late 1986, Faith No More was signed to Slash Records by Anna Statman. The label entered a distribution deal with Warner Brother Records in 1982, ensuring a widespread release, distribution, and marketing for the band's upcoming album. On April 23, 1987, Faith No More released their second album, Introduce Yourself, on Slash Records. The album is considered by many, including the band itself, as their true debut album, mainly due to the first album's limited availability. I know that for myself, for many years, I thought Introduce Yourself was their first album. <laughs> this was the band's major label debut, with better production than the first. Introduce Yourself also has a re-recording of the song We Care A Lot with updated lyrics. The album was recorded in 1986 at Studio D in Sausalito, California. The changes in We Care A Lot's lyrics are rather small, but they make the song more tongue-in-cheek. The album was released on vinyl and cassette. The art, a very catching ink splatter, was originally going to be red, but the record label requested the color be changed. After the release, Faith No More joined the Red Hot Chili Peppers on their Uplift Mofo Party Tour. Faith No More opened for the Peppers for the first two and a half months of the North American tour. An article from World Radio History shows that the band was to play from October 22nd to Christmas of that year. The songs We Care A Lot and Chinese Arithmetic were released as radio singles in the fall of 1987 in promotion of the band's tour with the Chili Peppers. In 1988, music videos were released for We Care A Lot and Ann Song. The title track, Introduce Yourself, was originally called the Cheerleader Song, and it was written on Faith No More's first nationwide U.S. tour in 1986. The song was written when driving through Missoula, Montana. Roddy Bottom was inspired to write the song when the band went to a truck stop for coffee. He came up with the lyrics on the next leg of the journey while sitting in the passenger seat of the band's Dodge. Chuck wrote the lyrics exclusively to the songs Faster Disco, Chinese Arithmetic, Death March, The Crab Song, and Blood. Mosley and Bottom wrote Introduce Yourself and We Care A Lot. Billy Gould and Mosley wrote Ann Song and R&R. &R. In 1988, Chuck said that the song Death March was about a friend of his that was doing a lot of drugs and just went in the ocean and drowned. I used to be on the beach all the time and I got the feeling that he was so fucked up when he drowned that he doesn't even realize he's dead. He's out there, still swimming around. Death March is someone talking to their dead lover, the soul lingering on. Much of this album has been played with Mike Patton, except for the songs and song Arabian Disco and New Beginnings. The label wanted them to get as much exposure as possible. To quote, through touring, you can really create a groundswell. By the time they come off the road, they will have done about 110 dates. This is from a World Radio History article. Faith No More's sound was described as a blend of punk, thrash, and new age. Radio didn't know what to do with the band, but the aim was the college audience at the time. Any kid who likes Metallica or even The Clash will like this band, the article stated. Jim Martin recalled the early Faith No More touring days during the We Care A Lot era. We traveled across the country and had about 30 dates in 90 days. It was brutal. We saw very little money and as a consequence, we ate very little. Chuck was an asshole. The wheels fell off the truck. We met many generous people who let us stay with them. We lived in the Metroplex in Atlanta, Georgia for a couple of weeks. Rats ate hot and sour soup out of my beard. During this time, Chuck's behavior became increasingly erratic, with a troubled European tour in 1988. One of Chuck's friends, the roadie, was fired after getting into a fist fight with guitarist Jim Martin. By the time that happened, Chuck was already kind of out of it for me, 
said Billy Gould. It came to a point where Jim was our guitar player, and he broke his hand fighting the guy. It was the first night of our European tour, and somebody had to go. It obviously wasn't going to be our guitar player. Chuck took it very personally, sticking up for his roadie. During this tour, Chuck would punch Billy Gould on stage. The final straw was when the band came home. There was a certain point when I went to rehearsal, and Chuck wanted to do all acoustic guitar songs. It was just so far off the mark. I think I actually attacked him again. Gould is quoted having laughed as he recalled the story. Instead of outright firing Mosley, Gould used a tactic that had been done in the past. I got up, walked out, and quit the band. Just said, I'm done. I can't take this any longer. It's just so ridiculous. The same day, I talked to Borden, and he said, Well, I still want to play with you. Bottom did the same thing. It was another one of those firing somebody without firing them scenarios, Billy Gould said. After Chuck was fired, rumors began to circulate about his alleged party lifestyle. In one quote, Chuck said, I've never been addicted to heroin, but I've done everything from PCP to acid. I had a problem with coke, but which I don't touch anymore. The year of that quote is unknown. Looking at the firing, Mosley said, I said, I don't want to leave. I want to work this out. I did a couple of things to gesture that I was going to work alongside them, not against them. But by that point, they were already too sick of me. I felt bad about it. But what can you do? One rumor about Chuck was that he had died of an overdose, which is why Mike Patton was brought on to Faith No More, which obviously was not the truth. While Mike Patton did replace Chuck, Mosley was still living. In one article from Louder Sound, it states that Mosley admitted his departure from Faith No More had been due to his struggles with addiction. In 1989, Mosley sued the other members of Faith No More, claiming a partnership interest in the band's financial assets. They eventually settled, and Mosley agreed to give up his rights to the band's works, most of its assets, and its name. This suit is rather unclear when looking at the timeline. One source states that this was introduced in 1989, yet it seems like it wasn't finally settled until 2014 or so. At the same time, there was another suit, if I understand correctly, around in or around 2015, which I will discuss later, but I'll be completely honest, I'm not understanding the 1989 uh, just moniker. What, what does that have to do with anything? After Faith No More, Chuck joined the Bad Brains in 1990. On the Metallum, he is listed as having been in from 1990 to 91, and on Wikipedia he stated to have left in January of 1992. He played at about 60 shows with them in the U.S. and Europe, but he did not record with them. In 1992, Chuck formed the band Cement. They released two albums, Cement, in 1993, and Man with the Action Hair in 1994. Both albums were distributed by Dutch East India Trading and Rough Trade. Their self-titled album was released on cassette, vinyl, and, C and CD with variations of the album art. Chuck is credited with vocals and acoustic guitar. The album is punky, a continuation of the type of style that Mosley had with Faith No More. They made a music video for the song Shout. On their second album, Mosley was credited with vocals, acoustic guitar, and piano. They made a music video for the song Pile Driver. The band toured the U.S. and Europe during the first week of what was to be a year-long tour for Man with the Action Hair. The band's driver fell asleep at the wheel, causing a major accident. This crash broke his back, it brought on a hernia, which led to to a struggle with opiates. To quote Mosley, I was 45 years old and the drugs masked everything. 
It feels like an upper at some point, because you get up and do stuff and everything. But in the interim, I was turning into an old man. I'd been addicted to feeling good, not feeling any pain. Mosley spent a year recovering from a broken back. The tour was canceled and the band was essentially shelved. It doesn't look like Cement with Mosley is on Spotify. A few albums are on Amazon to buy, though it is all physical media. Some videos with the band's music are on YouTube, thanks to some very generous people. Between the two albums, I personally like the second more, but both were good. You know, if you like the punk, funk, rock mix that came to be in the 90s. It's a bit sad that Cement didn't get to have a future after this, because I think it really did utilize Chuck's talents. To me, the second album would have been a great indicator of things to come, if the accident hadn't torn things apart. On the Metallum, Mosley is listed as having been with Cement from 1992 to 95. In 1996, Mosley moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where he spent several years writing and compiling material while raising his two daughters and working as a chef in various restaurants. That same year, the Chuck Mosley theory was formed. Not too much seems to be known about this band, just that Chuck was in it from 1996 to 1998. Setlist FM shows a small tour they did in 1997, playing shows from Chicago, Illinois, Salt Lake City, Utah, to eventually Cleveland, Ohio. The Metallum lists him as having played guitar and being on vocals for the group Vandals Against Illiteracy, which was started in 1999. They were abbreviated to V-U-A, as the joke was that the name, the words were spelled wrong. The band's name was later extended to include his name. In 2009, Chuck announced that an album would, would be released under V-U-A. On August 11th, 2009, the album Will Ramp Over Hard Rock for Food was released. The album had guest appearances from people like Jonathan Davis from Korn, John Five from Rob Zombie, Roddy Bottom, and more. The album had a lot of songs from the past that were re-recorded. It was released on Revered Image Unlimited. VUA had a second album, I guess you would call it, released, which was called Demos for Sale. It was originally released in 2013 by the band itself, without a label. In 2016, it was released by THC Music on CD and Ellefson Music Productions on vinyl. On March 21st, 2015, VUA released a single called The Untimely Death of a Loved One, along with the track Hard Rock Tune. It was only released digitally. On April 14th, 2010, Chuck made an appearance on stage at a Faith No More concert in San Francisco, which was the first time since 1988. He performed the songs, As the Worm Turns, Death March, We Care A Lot, and Mark Bowen. He was joined by Mike Patton at the final encore, performing a duet of Introduce Yourself. On November 17, 2012, Mosley re-released Will Rap Over Hard Rock while working on an autobiography. In 2014, he was interviewed extensively by author Greg Pato for the book Punk, Hardcore, Reggae, PMA, Bad Brains. In it, he recounted his time as a singer. In late 2014, he publicly revealed that he was broke and that his family were on the verge of eviction. The Blabbermouth article, posted on December 4, 2014, talked about how he had fallen on hard times and was asking for help from his fans so that he and his family could prevent being evicted from the house that they had lived in for the past decade. He posted on December 3, 2014, on his Facebook page, Hey friends and other peoples, I'm really dreading this. I fought myself over this for more than a couple of months. I seem to have no other choice than to lose my pride due to lacking ability to provide a sense of security for my family. The shocking truth is that I'm not rich. We struggle every day just like most everybody, more right now, worse than ever in a long time. 
Our landlord wants to sell the house we've lived in for 10 years. And yes, we are behind in our rent. So he's using that as leverage to get us out so he can fix up and sell right away. Technically, we're supposed to be out today, December 3rd, but he's deciding whether to give us another week. So here I am for my family, on my knees, asking for help. I'm ashamed for being in this condition. Our band, VUA, had had to put off trying to tour or play any shows. We're starting to record new stuff, but even that is suffering at the hands of my family's financial situation. I could go into a dissertation about how and why, but the bottom line is we are broker than we've been in a good, good long time and can't bail out. So here I am asking that anybody who could afford to send a few dollars to my slash our PayPal account and for any substantial donations, we will offer up my better half's portrait of my dog, Fredo, and me. Real Scarface meets me. She's an awesome artist. Her name is Pip Logan, and there's a few more pieces of her work she's willing to part with for a few of the more generous donations. Just throwing that out there. So please, if you can, help. We will be eternally grateful, and I will be eternally self-loathing for having to be at this level. I'm sorry for asking. If I could do anything for you, please ask. And I swear I will do everything in my power to serve you any way I can. We put the digital downloads of our albums, we'll rap over hard rock for food, and demos for sale, one dollar donation at chugmosleybandcamp.com. And we will be adding a few signed vinyl and CD copies soon. Big thanks to Matt for taking extra photos for the demo release, and to Christian for the graphic design help. A few hours later, Chuck went back to Facebook and thanked those for the response he received. We are overwhelmed by your support. I hate asking for help. The band camp is still around today, with the music being free to download. It states that they were released in 2021. I'm guessing that this might have been a re-upload or something. There is also the single What I Feel that Chuck did with the band Endoria which was released on December 17th, 2014. This track is also free. As stated before, there was a suit in 1989 that Mosley had with Faith No More. While they ended up settling, there seems to have been yet another legal battle in 2015. Apparently, Mosley agreed to give up his fight for his rights to the band's works, etc., in a superior court lawsuit filed in December 2015. This was after Mosley and his attorney had entered into a deal with Manifesto Records, assigning it the rights to We Care A Lot for $4,000, and agreeing to pay 20% of the royalties to the band. Mosley was entitled to one-fifth of those royalties under the agreement, with the other four members of the band each receiving an equal share. Faith No More said that they never knew the agreement even existed, let alone received royalties. Manifesto Records released a digital version of We Care A Lot that violated its settlement agreement with Mosley, Faith No More said. At the time, the band wanted to release a deluxe version of its debut. Manifesto planned to release a physical version of the album in November of 2015. The state court later dismissed Mosley from the complaint. Mosley said in an affidavit for the court that he had unwittingly signed over the rights, not knowing that his attorney, Evan Cohen, was also the owner of Manifesto Records, and that he did not understand what he was signing. Mosley had fallen on hard times and was working as a short order cook in Cleveland, Ohio. I desperately needed to have that money, so I signed it. I did not believe I was doing anything wrong. He stated in the 2016 affidavit, I am distraught that I am being sued by my former band members and even more distraught if I did something that would negatively impact my future relationship with the band, which I value. I consider certain members of Faith No More as my family. I never would have signed the manifesto contract if I fully appreciated the dissension it would cause or how the band would object. 
I certainly would never have signed the manifesto contract if I knew I was going to get sued, especially by my former bandmates. I am not saying I do not have certain rights in that album. I relied on Evan Cohen to explain it's my rights under to the me. state's anti-slap statute, which protects speech against frivolous Manifesto lawsuits. Records moved Superior to strike the band's Michael complaint. Johnson rejected the move in February of 2011, finding the case concerned a contract dispute, and the company cannot claim First Amendment protections. While Faith No More and the We Carolot album are involved in plaintiff's claim, they play a merely incidental role as the part as part of the factual backdrop of the claim, Judge Johnson is quoted. Manifesto Records then appealed the anti slap ruling. At the hearing in downtown L.A., Manifesto's attorney Bridget Hirsch urged the Second District Court of Appeals to reverse Judge Johnson's decision. She said that the court showed in showed ruling in Barrel v. Schnitt, which found that the anti slap statute applies to a broader array of claims, which include both protected and unprotected claims. Faith No More's attorney David Given said the defendant's use of anti slap motions was troubling and was bumping up against the entertainment industry. He said it was Faith No More's speech that the record company had taken and was now waving in front of the band. The court took the case under submission. In Mosley's affidavit, it stated, In early 2014, by my recollection, I entered in a contract with Manifesto Records, Inc. concerning the Faith No More album We Care A Lot, the Manifesto contract. The contract was put in front of me by Evan Cohen, who has always been my lawyer. As it turns out, Evan Cohen also owned Manifesto Records, Inc., I signed the manifesto contract because I trusted Evan Cohen. I never appreciated that Evan was not acting as my lawyer and solely was my best interests at heart when he asked to sign the manifesto contract. I later learned that there was a provision in the manifesto contract that Evan was not acting as my lawyer, but I never read the provisions. In fact, I really never read the entire contract before I signed it. Evan essentially offered me $4,000 if I signed the manifesto contract. I desperately needed to have that money, so I signed it. I did not believe that I was doing anything wrong. I wish I would have discussed the manifesto contract with Roddy Bottom, who is one of the plaintiffs and a present member of Faith No More. I sincerely wish today that I never signed the manifesto contract. I did not fully understand what I was signing. I did not appreciate that I apparently was speaking for the band as a whole concerning the rights to certain Faith No More recordings. I only believed I had an equal stake in the ownership of the We Care A Lot album and was speaking for myself as part of the owner of that album. I'm reserving all rights I may have in all Faith No More assets that I participated in creating, and by this affidavit I am not waiving any of those rights. I tried to call Evan Cohen several times after the lawsuit was filed to help me with this situation. We spoke one time. I was hoping Evan would rescind everything so we could all negotiate something with the blessing of the band. That has not happened. So I engaged another lawyer to try and help me, in particular with the lawsuit in Los Angeles. As stated above, the lawyer I engage agreed to help me for no money. I have no money to spend on lawyers. What I am saying in this affidavit is the truth. If I am called upon to testify to the matters I am stating here, I would do that. In 2013, Mosley joined the band in Doria a pop folk band from Cleveland, Ohio. He was on the song What I Feel as vocals on the 2014 album There's a Gleam. He was also on the 2016 album You'll Never Make the Six. In May of 2015, Chuck appeared with Faith No More again at a Detroit show performing the song Mark Bowen. In the fall of that year, he published a non-fiction essay in an anthology entitled A Matter of Words, which was about the writing and recording process of the song. 
In 2016, he toured the U.S. doing an unplugged show and a reissue of the album We Care A Lot with extra tracks. On July 20th of that year, Roddy Bottom joined Chuck on stage for a rendition of an Imperial Teen song. Imperial Teen being another project Roddy had worked on. A month later, Mosley performed two concerts with Faith No More, where he was billed as Chuck Mosley in France, where he opened with an acoustic set on August 18th in San Francisco and August 20th in L.A. This would be the last time that he'd perform on stage with Faith No More. The Detroit performance is posted on YouTube, with it being mostly disliked. In 2017, he joined the band Primitive Race. It was on their 2017 album, Soul Pretender, which was released on November 3rd, 2017. In July of 2017, Chuck played a fictional version of himself in the movie, Like an Open Heart, It Shines, by David Colopy. The movie was about his past catching up with his present, and on IMDb it says, But what does his future hold? On August 3rd, 2017, the Tribune Chronicle posted an article about Chuck, titled, Chef, Back to Making Music. It talked about how his career had enough starts and stops to cause other musicians to ignore the songs running in their heads and simply stay at home and contemplate what could have been. Chuck was a chef at one point to support his family, but songwriting never left his mind. Every time I go cook, and it doesn't matter how much I've done, unless it's a friend of mine, I've got to start over again, either prep or line cook or whatever. I have to prove myself every time I cook other people's food for way less money. So I figured, if I'm going to make no money, I should be doing what I love. He moved to Ohio when he went on musical hiatus after the Cement tour accident. His first daughter, Erica, was born in Woodstock when he toured with Bad Brains. He was always in a different city until she was two years old. He'd see her for never more than two weeks to a month until she was two or three years old, which skewed their relationship. She was hiding behind Mommy. Who's the hat? I said that wasn't going to happen when Sophie was born. I was working on music and learning to be a chef. I usually worked at night. So we'd have a sitter, and then I took care of her during the day while Mom was working. Basically, I did the whole school parties and playdate stuff. We bonded. He admitted that if his musical career had taken off, he would have been forced to make a decision. But even after vandals, he continued to work as a chef. By the time of the article, his daughters were adults, and Chuck was focusing more on his music. At the time, he was doing a tour called Reintroduce Yourself. Everything was pent up. For 20 years, I haven't been on tour. 13 years, I was waiting for a record to get done. That was real frustrating. The article ended talking about Chuck's excitement over his upcoming solo debut that he hoped to release in 2018. It's so good that I can actually put my name on it. All the naysayers are going to have to live with it. Earlier that year in March, Chuck was interviewed and it's quoted as having said, I was only ever focused on music, basically, and girls, and skating. I split my focuses around when I never became responsible. Put away for a rainy day, build a nest egg for your kids. That's my one regret. He then went on to talk about his book. The book's going to be a tell-all, but we don't have the exact ending yet. I'll either end up in prison or happily whistling down the road with playing shows. Hopefully, God forbid, it shouldn't end with my death. The consensus has always been that I'm going to be the one that hangs out longer than everybody. On the evening of November 9, 2017, Chuck Mosley was found dead by his longtime partner, Pip Logan, and their friend on the living room floor of their Cleveland home. Drug paraphernalia was found at the scene with police suspecting a heroin overdose. According to Blabbermouth, they found syringes next to his body. Pip Logan told police that she last saw Chuck earlier that day at 11 a.m. 
as she and a friend returned right before 8 p.m. to find Chuck's lifeless body on the floor. Police also found a spoon with residue and a baggie by his body. Faith No More issued a, a statement about Mosley, remembering him as a reckless and caterwauling force of energy, who delivered with conviction and helped set us on a track of uniqueness and originality that would not have developed the way it had had he not been a part. How fortunate we are to have been able to perform with him last year in a reunion style when we re-released our very first record. His enthusiasm, his sense of humor, his style, and his bravado will be missed by so many. We were a family, an odd and dysfunctional family, and we'll be forever grateful for the time we shared with Chuck. Chuck's family wrote in a statement, After a long period of sobriety, Charles Henry Mosley III lost his life on November 9, 2017, due to the disease of addiction. We're sharing the manner in which he passed, in the hopes that it might serve as a warning or wake-up call or beacon to anyone else struggling to fight for sobriety. He is survived by long-term partner Pip Logan, daughters Erica and Sophie, and his grandson Wolfgang Logan Mosley. The family will be accepting donations for funeral expenses. On November 13, 2017, the Endoria Band page made a post talking about Chuck's passing. They stated that the song Reason to Live was written as they saw Chuck struggle with addiction and was keeping up with everything that life threw at him. By the sounds of it, it seems like Chuck might have been using before his death and that November 9th was not just some random out-of-the-blue thing. This is my own speculation, though. The Facebook page, Chuck Mosley Band, keeps his memory alive today. His personal Facebook page has been memorialized. On February 28, 2019, Block Sonic made the announcement that Chuck's final recordings would be released on April 13, 2019. Recorded in August of 2017, Chuck covered the songs Nothing Compares to You, that was written by Prince, and Take This Bottle by Faith No More. The latter is a song from the album King for a Day, Fool for a Lifetime. They were released on vinyl limited to 600 copies. On October 17, 2019, a tribute page to Chuck called Chuck Mosley Forever posted that a tribute album would be released or available to order on Halloween of that year. It was called We Still Care A Lot and had covers by various artists who played songs by Faith No More, VUA, Endoria, and Cement. On November 5th, 2019, a trailer was posted on YouTube by Brian Payone for a book about Chuck. The book, reintroducing Chuck Mosley, Life On and Off the Road, chronicled Chuck's life musically and personally. The book released on December 3rd, 2019, and is available for purchase on Amazon. Written by Douglas Esper, it intertwines stories about Chuck's life with Esper's stories and friendship with Mosley. The description partially leans a bit more into Mosley's drug usage, saying, A self-proclaimed junkie and a liar, Chuck shot himself in the foot over and over by shooting up elsewhere on his body. Meanwhile, I stumbled and fumbled and pushed and pulled to earn extra chances, to earn him extra chances to prove himself. With that said, I could not find a find a grave page for Chuck, and I don't know whether he was buried, cremated, or what have you.